Welcome to the Reinventing Transport Show, the international podcast that helps you push for better urban mobility and better cities. Today I'm going to talk about parking. Now, some of you may know that I have another podcast and website called Reinventing Parking. And today I'm going to intrude on reinventing transport with some parking stuff. What I'm going to try to do is to help you, the reinventing transport listener, with how can you do better with parking. You're probably not someone for whom parking is your main thing. Uh, You may not be deeply into parking at all. I hope I can help you. I have a slogan that I sometimes use, urban success and even parking success, but without parking excess. I'll run through a few basic ideas of how we need to think about parking to do better. There's no one place in the world that is doing brilliantly on parking. I can't point to the ultimate parking policy paradise, but I can point to many different policies that, if we bring them together, should do much better. Automobiles, cars take up a lot of space in cities. One of the key ways they take up a lot of space is when they're parked, especially off-street parking. You might think of that as having cars out of the way when they're parked, but in fact, every single off-street parking space tends to take up about 30 square metres per parking space. That's because you have to include the aisles, the ramps, the pillars, the turning areas. So it's not just each parking space. So that's a huge amount of real estate for storing vehicles. 30 square metres is about the average housing floor area per person in many reasonably wealthy countries, for example, European countries. And that parking is also expensive. In a parking building, a parking structure, you would need to recover at least 200 US dollars a month to be close to recovering the cost of every single parking space. A good rule of thumb is it costs more than the car that it's going to serve. Generally, a car costs less than a structured parking space. That was Todd Littman in episode three of the Reinventing Parking podcast. One of the keys to doing better on parking is to think differently about parking, to reframe the conversation around parking, change mindsets about parking, because people have become accustomed to thinking about parking in ways that are not helpful. Most cities around the world, most jurisdictions around the world plan parking, off-street parking with buildings, in the same way that they plan toilets. Very strange. What I mean by that is that every development is expected to provide enough parking to meet its own demands, just like every development is expected to provide enough restrooms. But parking is not like restrooms in many ways. The rationale for doing this is the same. We don't want people to do it in the streets. It seems easier to require every development to provide these things, whether it's parking or restrooms, than for the city to provide public versions of restrooms or parking. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that requiring developers to provide restrooms is a good thing. But requiring developers to provide parking with developments is much more questionable because parking is not like restrooms in several key key ways. For example, People are often happy to park in the streets. They park in the streets without embarrassment. Even if we have off-street parking, it's not enough to just provide it. People will park in the streets unless there's some kind of parking management that will nudge them to park off-street. So the off-street parking does not necessarily prevent the mess in the streets. Another difference is that everybody needs restrooms. Restrooms are equitable. This is quite unlike parking. Parking is only for motorists. Only people who own cars need parking. And in many cities in the world, this is a small minority, often a very privileged minority. Some occupy the parking for hours on end. We can predict how many restrooms we need in a building reasonably accurately. It's much more difficult to actually predict how much parking is needed. And if we get it wrong, well, it's not so costly to provide more than enough restrooms. We don't have to provide, make half of our building restrooms to be confident that we have more than enough restrooms. Whereas in car dependent societies, most developments will need 
more than half of the floor space will need to be parking to be confident that they have enough. Furthermore, if we accidentally oversupply restrooms, it doesn't encourage excessive use of restrooms, does it? Parking is a different matter. We oversupply parking, we drive the price down, we make it extremely convenient to park at every destination across the city, and we are fueling car dependence. We are encouraging excessive use of cars. So parking and restrooms are not alike. And so planning parking like restrooms is not a sensible thing to do. I think it's more sensible to think of parking as more like restaurants or meeting rooms in hotels or meeting rooms generally. Some kind of real estate. Think about parking as if it's real estate. Another way we need to think differently about parking is stop thinking of parking as a public good. Okay, Now, if your town or city was not too crowded, not too many cars in the past, the curbside space for parking was probably plentiful relative to, to the demand, and people got used to simply parking for free and without too much problem. At that time, thinking of parking as a public good, which means that your use does not affect my use, and that it's not really doesn't really make sense to price it or exclude anybody from the parking since it's uh, it's underused anyway. It makes sense to think of parking as a public good in that case. That's a that's a rare situation. Most cities are not like that. Most districts in most cities are not like that. Parking very often is something where my use of the parking does affect your use of the parking. Unless there's some kind of management, then we'll get overuse of that parking. It's much better to think of on-street parking in that situation as something like a commons, an overused common property resource, like a river that is overfished or a grazing land that is overgrazed. And in those situations, we need to manage the use of those commons. Similarly, on-street parking in most dense cities and dense parts of cities will inevitably be overused at least some of the time, and we need to manage that parking. On-street parking is best thought of as a common property resource that needs to be managed. Off-street parking is best thought of as a real estate-based service. Let me try to summarize the crux of the problem with how most cities are dealing with parking at the moment. Many cities have a problem, an acute parking problem, in the streets. Many cities are not managing that overused common property resource well enough, and so they have acute problems in the street with uh, illegal parking, parking that's full all the time, so people resort to illegal parking or double parking. People arrive and can't find parking. And so that's one part of the problem for many places. But a second part of the problem is that the cure that is usually prescribed for that acute on-street parking problem is to require off-street parking or for the city to try to provide a lot of off-street parking. So the problem is that that's expensive. It drives up the cost of real estate. It drives down the supply of various kinds of real estate, such as housing, which increases the cost of housing and increases the cost of real estate generally. Here's Todd Littman again. So, for example, with conventional parking requirements, a developer might need to provide 100 parking spaces in an office that's designed to accommodate, let's say, 200 workers. And that requires going underground. It requires digging a very deep hole, two or three levels down to provide all that parking. And those holes are extremely expensive and they they can spoil the business case for that office building. It also fails to really solve the on-street parking problem because the real solution to on-street parking problems is actually managing on-street parking. Study after study shows that that off-street parking is often underused and it's very easy for for huge amounts of off-street parking to be built in cities that are rapidly developing. And this excessive parking is generating too much traffic. So what's what's the alternative? Instead of trying to require lots of excessive off-street parking to solve the on-street parking problems, what can we do? Because these problems are real. If you go to the Reinventing Parking website, you'll find several articles where I've I've written about a package of 
parking policies that I think can help. They're inspired by various people, including Donald Shoup, uh, Japanese parking policies, Todd Littman, several other people with excellent ideas about parking. So I've put them together. I call it adaptive parking. Adaptive parking is an approach to municipal parking policy, so local government parking policy, that hopes and aims to deliver parking success without excess. It tries to make parking more responsive to local conditions so that you'll have the appropriate parking policies for each place. So adaptive parking has six policy thrusts. There's a mnemonic, I use a mnemonic, a a memory aid, respond. So the R in respond stands for relax. And so relax means relax about parking supply. Stop fretting about parking supply. Stop boosting parking supply. Especially it means abolish parking minimums, abolish minimum parking requirements. This is not as radical as it may sound. A recent episode of Reinventing Parking podcast talked about Berlin, and we talked about how Berlin has abolished all parking minimums except for parking spaces for people with disabilities and for bicycles. It's been generally a success, relatively uncontroversial. You can do it too. And if you're an urbanist or a sustainable transport advocate, you should be supporting abolition, not just reduction. Support abolition of minimum parking requirements. That's the R in Respond. You can find out a lot more on the Reinventing Parking website if if you become interested in this. Or you can sign up for the Reinventing Parking podcast as well. The E in Respond is Engage. You have to engage with locals' fears about parking. Local local community members are afraid that parking is going to be um, horrendously unpleasant and a difficulty for them, and they have good reason for that. We need to ease their fears and offer them some value. So whatever we do to solve the parking problem, we'll need to provide value for local people, engage with their concerns. This is a political part of the package. We can't do anything unless we please the local stakeholders. No matter where you are, there will be local, locally appropriate ways in which you can make sure that those people who feel they have some sense of ownership over that parking that we are now going to manage in new ways need to be uh, engaged with and give them a reason to support better parking management in the streets, for example. The S in Respond is share. By that I mean open more of the parking that already exists in the area to the public. Make parking more of a public thing and therefore shared. On the Reinventing Parking website, I talk a lot about walkable parking. It's a whole different way of thinking about parking compared to the old idea that parking has to be provided on site with every building, with every development site. Instead of thinking that parking is something that must be there must be enough parking on every development site this share idea this walkable parking way of thinking about parking encourages us to think about parking as something for the neighborhood for a whole neighborhood overall you need significantly less parking if parking is shared and public for the whole neighborhood than if you're requiring every single building to have enough parking for its own peak period time another reason that public parking is more efficient is it generally will be managed. Of course, this works best if the neighborhood is mixed use so that you get that complementary peak period phenomenon. So this goes very well with walkable urbanism in mixed use, relatively dense neighborhoods where people can park or come by some other method, of course, and walk around. So this idea of share Emphasizing public parking, emphasizing walkable parking is compatible with walkability. There are several articles on the Reinventing Parking website about this idea of walkable parking. The P in Respond is price. And this is about rationing, really. There are other ways to ration besides pricing, but pricing is the most common and the best one in most circumstances. So price Set different prices for different places and different times such that each place and time avoids having parking that is too full. We're trying to make sure that every street, every street section will have some empty spaces so that people arriving by car can find a space. When it comes to off-street parking, don't try to 
control the price of off-street parking, as some cities in India are trying to do. Some cities in China and in and Indonesia and in Colombia try to regulate the price of private sector commercial parking. That's a mistake. In most places in the world, it is a market-based thing without too much problems. And city-owned parking, off-street parking, can be set in a similar way to the on-street parking. If it's too full, raise the price. If it's too empty, you can decrease the price. The ON in Respond is about on-street parking. In particular, on-street parking needs strong control. Getting firm and effective on-street parking management is a key foundation for the whole thing. We can't relax about parking supply unless we have on-street parking under better control. Again, on the Reinventing Parking website, there's a lot of detail about this. I won't go into too much detail now. Some of it is a little technical, but the crux of it is we need to get the design of on-street parking better. We need to improve the enforcement of on-street parking, and we need to ration on-street parking more effectively in many cases. Usually that means pricing. And finally, the D is demand management. Now, many people who are keen on sustainable transport, when they first think about parking policy, they jump straight to this one and think, okay, let's use parking policy as a travel demand management tool. Well, my view is, yes, you can use parking as a travel demand management tool. It's 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 a good parking travel demand management tool, but don't get ahead of yourself. You need to have the basics in place first before you can do that. And the locations where you can use parking as a demand management tool are primarily in transit-rich locations, places where people have good alternatives. So this will be often city centres, but also other sub-centres that have good um, access by other means besides cars. We can limit the supply of parking in those locations is the, is the key tool. This is something that's been done since the 1960s in a large number of cities. London was actually a pioneer in restricting its central city parking supply and gradually driving the price of parking upwards in the CBD, the central business districts. Seoul is an example. Its main business districts restrict the supply of parking quite intensely and allow the commercial parking prices to increase. There are a few other ways where parking management can be part of travel demand management. If your jurisdiction has some kind of workplace travel demand management, then one of the key things that workplaces will do is they may price parking for their employees. They might have a parking cash out. Instead of giving free parking, they give all of the employees some kind of uh, payment. And those who want to drive, continue to drive will use that payment for parking and others can just pocket the money or, or use it for other alternative ways of getting to work. We can encourage the unbundling of residential parking so that if somebody wants to rent or buy a unit, they have the choice of whether or not to also rent or buy parking. And this has huge benefits for affordability and giving people a choice. I think proponents of sustainable transport, of um, bicycles as an as a option, proponents of public transport... Uh, proponents of walkability, proponents of housing affordability and livability and urbanity need to pay more attention to parking. And it's a huge opportunity to do better. I've tried to describe adaptive parking in a way that it can be adapted to many, many contexts uh, around the world. It, it's not specific to any one context. Urbanists and uh, transport reformers all over the world could do well if they support these steps that I summarise as respond, relax, engage, share, price, on-street parking management under strong control and the opportunity of using parking as demand management, respond. So there's a prize here. What we're looking for ultimately is the prize of more freedom, more choices, more options. If, if we can do better with parking without parking excess, Hopefully we will reduce traffic, we'll improve housing affordability, we, we'll unleash a land bank that's currently in parking in many places, we'll give transit-oriented development a boost, and we'll, we'll give urban infill a boost, but without creating horrendous traffic. So it also enables us to future-proof the parking 
ecosystem so that our parking systems can adapt to change because there's a lot of change coming in transport potentially. So I, I think many places around the world could benefit from even small steps on each of these adaptive parking policy thrusts. So could this work for you? Is this something that's relevant to your endeavors? As I said at the beginning, I have another podcast called Reinventing Parking. So if this has sparked your interest, I'd urge you to sign up and uh, subscribe to the Reinventing Parking podcast as well. Don't forget, you can always go to reinventingtransport.org for more information, to listen to other episodes, to find out how to subscribe or to leave a comment, suggestion or question. Go to reinventingtransport.org. This has been the Reinventing Transport Show and I'm Paul Barter. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Bye for now.